Welcome. Thank you for being with us. I'm Meg Daly, the Associate Dean of Undergrad Education and a Professor of Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology at Ohio State. I'm a veteran of the Opportunity Institute. I think this is my fourth or fifth. Uh, and I'm a major fan of the way that this community and the time to work with colleagues can really inspire and ignite good work for our students, colleagues, and institutions. I'm acting today as facilitator for this workshop on large courses, portals to student success. And what we mean by large courses, we had a bit of a conversation about this beforehand. These are courses that tend to be large in their format and in their enrollment, given our institutional norms, in their scope of material covered, and in their impact on the curriculum of multiple degrees. We're running this session as a cross between a panel and a workshop. We're leaning on the experience of our featured panelists to spark conversation and collaboration with you. And we'll be using tools like Menti to gather responses on the fly, soliciting responses in the chat, and holding space for conversation and participation collectively and in breakout groups. If you're in a big group and you're sharing um, kind of through a single computer and going in the chat or Menti isn't easy, you're lucky because you have a whole group there captive and you can just do the conversation in real time with the people in the room. I'm gonna start by introducing each of our panelists and while they're sharing who they are, what courses they're going to be focusing on today and what the major issues those courses pose, I want you to go to Menti. The code is in the chat and it's also visible on the screen um, and answer a couple questions. Um, if you have never used this tool, you simply go to the site with this code, you'll get directed to questions particular to our session. Um, there'll be two in a row while our presenters talk about their courses. So give me a minute. I'm navigating between about a thousand open windows. Okay. So I'm going to have you answer the mentee while I introduce our panel. Alan Bester, faculty at Georgetown University. Heidi Elmendorf, faculty at Georgetown University and ATI Opportunity Institute Superstar. You've seen Heidi at a bunch of these different sessions, and Jim Fowler, faculty at Ohio State. And I'm just going to have you guys go in alphabetical order by first name to talk about what you teach, who your students are, and the couple, one or two big issues facing students in the large format course you teach. So Alan, we'll lead off with you. Hi. So uh, good morning, everybody, or I guess good afternoon now, but thanks for stopping by, especially those people on the West Coast. Um, so I've taught a number of different courses. Uh, this is this fall will be 25 years in undergraduate teaching. Um, currently, I'm professor of the practice at Georgetown in the economics department. I teach the intermediate micro as well as the econometrics courses. Uh, these are sort of the the weed out classes, if, if to use an annotated term that I hope we can get rid of in the major. Uh, their enrollments usually around between 60 to 70. Uh, and they're really about making the transition from, in economics, the, the very social science -y, very non-technical principles courses to the upper level courses in, in economics, which tend to have quite a bit of quantitative in, uh, emphasis, including tools from vector calculus. So there's quite a bit of a jump for students coming into those courses um, in terms of the expectations, the rigor, which is, I know, a word that we'll get into a lot today. And there are a lot of students uh, that come in very anxious about the expectations vis-a-vis -vis what they saw in principles. Uh, I also taught at the beginning of my career uh, statistics, basic statistics at uh, Chicago Booth to MBA students. So some, some experience teaching uh, professional students on the introductory level. And in between, I ran a master's of financial economics program at University of Western Ontario. So I have some limited experience with program design, although a lot of that experience is realizing that I think of, of, of course design and curriculum design a lot differently from uh, some of my colleagues. So nice to meet all of you. Great, thanks, Alan. Heidi. Hi, so I'm Heidi Elmendorf. I'm also, as folks probably know by now, at Georgetown University. Um, and I teach a course that we call Foundations in Biology One. So that's the first semester of biology for folks who aren't biologists. It means we go from, it's all about little stuff, atoms to organisms. Um, students in my course, um, most science majors at Georgetown end up in this because uh, we believe in kind of cross-pollinating in our curriculum across the sciences. Um, most of the pre-meds on our campus. Um, Post-baccalaureate students, we run a very large post-bac uh, pre-med program here at Georgetown. Um, and definitively, everybody who's going to be a bio major. And this will come up later on, but we actually... Um, you can't place out of this course with AP or IB or dual enrollment credit. So it really is kind of everybody who comes on in through that portal. 
Um, we're a really big course by Georgetown standards. I've got um, in any given semester, 200 to 250 students in that class. And again, that's one of the largest courses on our campus. And we realize that we've got a lot of folks here from large public institutions. And you're probably thinking that's not huge, but at Georgetown, um, that's a different experience than many students face in other courses. Um, most of those students um, are also first semester students, um, particularly if they're anywhere in the science realm. Um, but for lots of our students, it's also just gonna be one of their very first science courses, even if they're taking it later in their time. Okay, Meg asked for like one or two big issues. So it's one of them is just that we're a big course. Um, and as Meg pointed out, um, we're big in the scope of the course. So, you know, like we're like half of biology. Um, we're, uh, and so that's the content piece of it. Um, we're big in terms of a weight in the student schedule. Um, so we're actually the equivalent of one and a half courses because we have a lab attached to us. Um, and we're big in size. So we meet in one of those very dehumanizing lecture halls. Um, and then the other big, the other challenge that I'll name or the issue that I'll name is that we serve as a portal into um, curriculum for a lot of students. We serve as a portal into careers for a lot of students. Um, and we serve as a portal into college for a lot of students. So, so this one course has a kind of disproportionate weight in students' minds about the importance of it and how it reflects on them and who they are now and who they and who they want to become. And I'll that stop is a, That is such an important piece thinking about how this all impacts who they are and how they think about themselves. Jim. Yeah, thank you. It's just a wonderful opportunity to be able to share and for us all to get together to think about some of these issues in these uh, in these large courses. Uh, so I'm here as a representative from Ohio State. It's just a huge team in the Ohio State uh, math department that handles uh, some of our really large courses, um, and in particular, Calculus One. Uh, I guess the biggest version of that. We've got a lot of different Calc One experiences at Ohio State, but the really big one is Math 1151. That's sort of the, the most standard uh, Calc One course, and, and I reach just about 3,000 students a year uh, in, in that course. Um, so there's a huge team of people that that are involved with with running that course, and I think you've really um, very thoughtfully um, been improving that course uh, over the years. Um, one, I think, interesting thing about our population of students is that most of the students in that Calc 1 course have already taken a course called Calculus in high school. Uh, so it's kind of fun to think about the ways in which our college experience can build on our students' prior learning um, in for what many of them was their their high school uh, calculus course. Great. So it looks like math is also a big topic for a lot of our, I'm going to go back yeah. and then see. It's a big topic for a lot of our participants. So I think we'll have math, statistics, economics, these core STEM classes um, are, are big for our participants. So I'm looking forward to a good conversation there. So why don't we talk a little bit about what you're doing um, to make your course uh, more of a of a portal for student learning. Um, and I'll, again, I'll go backwards. I'll start with Jim and, and wind up with Alan. Talk a little bit about what you're doing in calculus um, to, to try and address some issues with students' success uh, and opportunity. Yeah, so we've certainly made a lot of changes in the calculus course um, over the last few years. A lot of that's been around assessment. So in all of our um, sections of 1151, the big calculus course. Uh, we've made significant changes to assessment. We've increased the number of midterms dramatically. So we've got five midterms now. Uh, we've explicitly added a group work component. So we've got six written homework assignments during the term that are to be done uh, in, in small groups. Uh, we're very heavily using grade scope to facilitate all of uh, this this grading, and we're really expecting students to you know not just get the right answer, but to, to show their work and communicate um, their understanding of mathematics. Um, along with the changes that have happened to all of the, the sections of calculus in Math 51, we've also uh, been fortunate to uh, be part of the HHMI Driving Change um, project at um, at Ohio State, uh, which has enabled us to run some pilots of 1151 with uh, more innovative changes to assessment. Um, the, the biggest thing uh, being standards-based grading, so replacing the 
sort of traditional points-based grading where we add up a bunch of points to determine people's final course grade uh, with a standards-based system where uh, folks earn a final grade based on whether or not they meet or don't meet a certain collection of standards. And I think that's been, well, I think it's a more principled way of handling assessment, but it's also been interesting because uh, it's, it's been an opportunity for uh, the huge team of people that are involved with calculus to have a lot of conversations about, about those standards. And that's been, I think, really fruitful. That's great. And, and I guess I forgot to ask you as you were started, what's the value proposition for, for the kind of revisions that you're doing? What are you aiming to do um, specifically in this course or kind of more broadly? Yeah, so I think there's a, a couple things. So I mean, certainly the, the big thing is making sure that the course is, um, is just more equitable. You know, I think there's um, a lot of opportunity to improve um, sort of student success outcomes and make those outcomes more equitable across the student population. That's really the thinking around standards-based grading. Um, the, and the other thing I think is, is helping students to make this transition from high school to, um, to, to college. Part of that is things like group work. Um, certainly for me, you know, a big part of, uh, I think, my experience of, you know, uh, a college was doing math with other people, you know, and we want to make sure that our courses are, are preparing people to make the transition from, you know, what can be maybe more independent work to more collaborative work in college. Right. And Heidi's doing some back end uh, work on keeping the meeting running smoothly. So I'm going to go to Alan. Alan, um, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in your course, what the value proposition is for it, and how you've made some changes to enhance to kind of maximize that value proposition? Well, uh, I guess a couple general things, and and that's, I think you really have to set the tone and be very upfront about expectations in terms of, not just in terms of topics covered, but in terms of how you see the class. I mean, I think Meg's question about value proposition is very important because when you go to a lot of these curriculum design meetings and you talk, the focus tends to be on lists of topics. And what students really want to know is, why am I here? What am I in this course to do? And, and the way that I sell it to students is we're, we're here to build a toolbox, okay? And we're not trying to provide you with every tool you're ever going to need professionally in that toolbox because that's ridiculous. You got you, a lot of my students are going to be working on things in five years and two years that I'm not familiar with, okay? But we're here to, to create that toolbox, to teach you how to organize it, and to put a few fundamental, fundamentally useful tools, your, your screwdriver, your hammer in there, and to teach you how to organize it so that you can add to it over time, okay? It, the classes, I, I joke to my students, I call it the leg day of econ classes. And I think you've, you've got you to have a hook like that early on to let students know how to view it, how to, how to think about what they're doing. Um, I, I use a couple of analogies on the first day of classes that I think are really, really good. And one is, yeah, I don't want you to think about this as a math class. I want you to think about this as a foreign language class, okay? The, the tools that we're here to develop are not, we're not just introducing a bunch of equations and symbols to make things harder. We're, we're trying to show you the underlying structure of the models and tools that people use in this field professionally so that when you have a conversation with an expert in the field, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's like we're speaking a different language. Well, guess what? you're gonna speak that language. And, and as a language, the expectation, the goal is that this is something that you're integrating into your daily thinking. It's, it's, it's mathematics, Jim and I talked about this, I believe in a call earlier, is it's about learning to structure thinking, not just learning to move a bunch of symbols around. And that's, that's really important in terms of setting expectations. Um, I, I guess the, the last thing is uh, content delivery wise, I, we did, I think as hard as COVID was, uh, I think we learned some useful lessons. Um, I, I think if you're not having at least one office hour a week on Zoom, uh, you ought to really consider it because a lot of students, it's it's much more convenient, it's easier to get there with that format. And the other thing is just by pure coincidence, I actually, you know, a couple of years ago, I had my midlife crisis, took a couple of years off of academia, academia travel around the world doing gaming stuff. And one of the things that that I learned from that is, the power of paying attention to how people consume their online media. So for example, one of the popular gaming formats is if you go on YouTube is a let's play, okay, is you watch somebody else play a game and they're explaining and they're giving you their views. Well, I thought, why not do that for homework solutions? So I've started making these videos, just little, little chunks, right? 15 minutes max, but 
little chunks on, hey, here's how you do this homework problem with some context, some explanation, and some ways, not only that how you get the solution, but where this fits into the class. That's the thing you always have to be doing is helping students build that narrative in terms of how does this thing that we're doing fit into the whole. Amazing. I um, Even though we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, I did not know about YouTube streaming econ homework, which I think that's phenomenal. Heidi, how about your biology class? What are you doing? What are you doing in that class? What's the value proposition, the big challenges for you? So I, I think one of the things that, that we discovered in an earlier conversation um, was how much the three of us shared. So, so we talk a lot about a toolbox in my class as being kind of the value proposition. Um, I first taught the foundations in biology class 24 years ago, um, and I taught my students things that semester factual things that um, are we now know to be quite wrong. Um, I, I, I was just factually incorrect. Um, and, and, you know, recognizing that kind of humbles you about what you think the value proposition is of a course. Um, so uh, so we've really reframed it. And now when we talk about foundation, um, what foundation means for us is really the totality of the science experience, right? We want to build that science foundation. And so, yes, and we'll come back to this question about rigor and things. We talk about all the concepts that you're supposed to talk about in a first semester bio class. Um, and we talk about them in some real depth. Uh, we also value skills, um, some technical skills, a lot of cognitive skills. We talk with the students openly about building habits of the mind. Um, but actually, most importantly, what we think we're all building together is a foundation of identity and a foundation for a community. Um, and our goal for that pulling on uh, Darnell Cole's provocation from yesterday is um, both about establishing a sense of belonging and a sense of mattering. Um, and I'm happy I can share with folks our syllabus for it. I actually peeled out just the first two pages because it's a very long document. Um, but the very first page of our syllabus is a page that's all about um, the value of community, the importance of community, um, and the importance of community to scientists. Not like we're artificially doing something, that this is how scientists do their work is in communities. Um, and the second page is a page about who all are members of that community. And I'll, I'll, I think I'll say a little bit more about that in response to a later question, Meg. Excellent. So here we were going to take a moment for you all to talk in groups. We were initially planning to set up breakout rooms, but you're all actually naturally in breakout rooms um, of your colleagues on campus, which is, that's great. That makes it really easy for us. What we'd like you to do is, is talk within your group about the, the courses that you're, that are problematic on your campus or that you're really focused on um, and what strategies are being used on your campus or that you heard about here that might scale uh, to, to the problems that you're having. Um, I'll post this as a, as a slide to frame it and give you guys about five minutes uh, to, talk, uh, to talk amongst yourselves about strategies that you've heard, new ideas that are pinging around your brain uh, for the courses that you're, that you're focused on. And I'll open the rooms. Is this my... Paul? Okay. Yes, please open the breakout rooms. Everybody's getting recombobulated as they come back. Um, anyone want to share what the what the breakout room highlighted for them? Questions that they were hoping we would have talked about in the first few minutes or issues from their own focal courses that haven't been surfaced yet or things they're excited about, um, you know, they're, they're thinking about now that they weren't thinking about a half an hour ago. And put it in the chat if you're feeling if it's if it's difficult to uh, to talk because of the way your room is set up. Well, that space stays open uh, even if we keep talking. So I'm going to uh, go back to our panelists and and ask you for. Uh, a question that I think is really important as you do this work on your campus, who are your who are your allies? Um, who helps you do this? Alan and Jim have already mentioned colleagues in their department. Who else are your allies? You guys can just start talking. Um, okay, I'll 
I'll go first here since I was already unmuted. I, I mean, so I have a lot of allies. I, I have a lot of faculty in my department are very supportive of, um, and in other departments are supportive of what we're building. Um, there's actually a lot of support by people who serve in the role of ad as advisors on our campus, um, who really appreciate the community that we're building um, and the role that it's serving, um, because they often are the ones left to clean up the messes, the <laughs> these large courses. Um, but actually, and maybe I'll be talking more about this one later, um, but by far and away, the most important allies that we have are our former students, um, a very large number of whom rejoin us uh, every semester as teaching assistants. Um, we do have a robust PhD program in biology at Georgetown, um, and uh, and they join us as teaching teams in a lot of courses, but we do not welcome them into foundations in biology. Uh, we actually just use students who've previously taken the course. And they are uh, powerful and, and important allies in all sorts of ways. So those are people who are helping you do the work of the day-to-day -day of the of the classes. Yeah. Who helped you get get a new approach or kind of move move a new paradigm uh, forward? So how did you how did you tackle the cultural change of not just starting on page one and ending on page four hundred and seventy two, um, the way the book lays out the material? I think that's a great question. I, I mean, I think there are two things. So one is that um, I've, from the moment I came to Georgetown, I've, be, I've been part of our Center for Teaching and Learning, which is a group called Candles here. Um, and a lot of colleagues whom I met there and actually colleagues who teach really different disciplines than I do were really powerful um, in helping me kind of rethink things. Uh, part of what shifted it, I don't know if this is an ally in the usual sense of the word, but where was the data. Um, and the data didn't tell a good story about who we'd been historically in this course for the full diversity of students that whom we wanted to welcome. Um, but again, Meg, I just it's the former students. Um, I, I think this is probably true of most places, but Georgetown students are blissfully honest. Um, and when you ask and listen, um, they'll tell you powerful truths. Uh, and so that helped us imagine something different. And they continue to do that. The course is mm -hmm. continually evolving and um, we continually get told important truths. And a culture that listens to those truths is an ally in this, uh, yeah. you know, culture that's data oriented and interested in the student. I, I, I also want to say one really simple thing maybe, but a really important. Um, I also have the great luxury of when I took over this course for real, I was already a tenured professor. Um, and you can use the privilege of tenure for a lot of things, but one of the things that you can use the privilege of tenure for is to be stubborn about curricular issues. Um, and so uh, so I've chosen to use a lot of the power of my tenure to be stubborn in the curriculum. And that's well worth it. That's excellent. That's a great... Um, that's a great reminder. Sorry, my desk is my uh, desk is auto leveling on me. Jim or Alan, who your are there allies that Heidi hasn't brought up that that have been important to changing, making changes in the curriculum in in your context? Well, I want to I want to echo Heidi's comment about uh, using former students as resources. I, I use undergraduate TAs as well as PhD student TAs, and uh, and both. Both are vitally important to the course of success. Um, the both sets of TAs, especially the PhD students at Georgetown, have been far and away better than uh, anywhere else I've I've been. They're they're extraordinarily engaged, and you know I think it's it's important as we think about our PhD students that look. We all know in academia, um, there there's sometimes there's not as high returns to to teaching as to other activities. And uh, for a lot of the PhD students, this is their first experience with teaching. And I, I think a lot about that and think a lot about the fact that I wanna make it a good experience. And and the use, use of former students doesn't have to, um, doesn't have to be limited to TAs. One of the things that I used to tell new faculty at Chicago is you really, one of the, the sort of, tricks to having a good experience is you, you identify a core group and get a core group of students to really buy in early and let them recruit for you. 
Okay. Let them get excited about the class and spread that, that, that positive energy in, in much the same way that you hear horror stories about a, a sort of dissatisfied or disaffected cohort can spread negative energy, right? It, it can work in both directions. And, and when you have that success, keep up with those students after the class, because that's going to be some of your best sources of, as Heidi was mentioning, honest and frank feedback, uh, not only about your course, but about, hey, how has my course, how did it, how'd you find it in terms of preparing you for the courses afterward? And even how'd you find it in terms of your first couple of years professionally? And those are, when you can bring in it, commenting to former students about, I have this former student who's now at X place and they and mention their experience, their lived experience in the course. Again, in a lot of what we say is in these courses, it can it can be so hard to show individual students that there's a there's a path to success for them personally, not in the sense of bullet points about what do I need to do to be successful in this course, but I can see a path to success for me personally in much the same way that you would design meeting with students one on one in a much smaller course. Well, knowing that that their predecessors have found that path to success, that can really, really help in terms of finding and believing that there is one. And so that really spoke to what Iowa just put in the chat about keeping student engagement and boosting attendance. Um, but I want, I guess, before I let Jim talk, I want to circle back to you and Heidi about the TA issue, I think um, this came up in the in the chat from UC Riverside, and TAs are so important. But the challenge of um, the challenge of buy-in, given that teaching is relatively less um, rewarded in the profession, and they may be not prepared. You know, they may not have the disciplinary background to really um, to to really excel in the classroom right away, and that vulnerability is challenging. It can be difficult with your colleagues if you're asking a lot. If it's a hard TA, um, it can be difficult to, to have your colleagues um, assign their students or be okay with their students TAing those classes. So do you have any words of wisdom about that TA mentorship and participation piece? So for me, um, it's I think a lot of people talk about preparation. Uh, at least in economics, your, your modal you know, first or second year PhD student, certainly second year and above, it, is going to have they have more than enough preparation to TA for an undergraduate course. That's not an issue. What, what I've really found is that a lot of it is determined by departmental culture and expectations. And you have to really be hyper aware. You know, I'm at, I had a place, Georgetown, for whatever reason in economics, the culture is very strongly, you're expected to do a good job. You know, the stipends are relatively generous and uh, the TAs there really do put in the work. Uh, other places that I've been, that's that's not that's been a lot less so the case. And you really need to be hyper aware of what are the expectations of uh, around and the culture around the people in my department that are being asked to be my TAs, and and to what extent do I need to set it, step in at the beginning of the course and and make clear that my expectations may or may not be different. I at, at Chicago. I would routinely use a decent chunk of my research budget to to give my TAs bonuses because honestly, I, I wanted the pick of the best people. It, it made a huge difference for me in the classroom. And and you know what? It it doesn't have to be in dollar terms that much, but the the idea that these folks are know that they're getting something as a recognition from me, even not that big a monetary amount. That goes a long way in terms of their willingness to, throughout the semester, go the extra mile. I'm just shocked that that, that kind of economic model works among, among economists. <laughs> it's a real marriage of the discipline and the reward structure. Uh, Jim, do you do you promise? Uh, do you promise? No, <laughs> cash, cash to get rewards. <laughs> yeah. How do you? Who are your allies in calculus? Um, yeah, so certainly within the department, I mean, they're just amazing people that facilitate this. Like, like Bobby Ramsey is our Calc 1 coordinator, has done an amazing job, I think, with this material. Uh, Elizabeth Miller has been super involved. I mean, it's really incredible, I mean, how much leadership they've, uh, yeah, and I mean, how many changes that we've been able to make to the 
to the health one curriculum. I mean, I think at Ohio State, the other thing that's really cool is, is being able to connect across departments and with things like the HHMI project and previous uh, sort of grant funded things that we've applied for and gotten or not gotten. Um, it has been really nice to be able to, to collaborate with folks in, in physics, and chemistry, say. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot talking, talking with them. So. How about you guys who are, those of you who are in a position where you can chime in either in the chat or um, or just you know raise your hand or, or speak up. We'd love to hear about other pockets of allies or approaches that can kind of, people you can use uh, in the effort to, uh, to overcome some of these. Are there, are there constituencies we haven't considered? If you'd like to sing the praises of a strategy or an ally, we would love to hear about it. Yeah, and we'll, we'll leave the chat open for that. Well, so I'll throw out one more think, idea. Yeah, please. And that's, uh, so I happen to also run the undergraduate internship program through the uh, the econ department at Georgetown. And one one resource that I try to follow up with is, is the employers, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, business schools uh, where, I, where I started my career are really, really good about this. The, their career services departments know exactly where the students get hired. They get feedback on each student. Uh, they ask for feedback for students that didn't get hired confidentially. Uh, and, you know, I'm not I'm not going to go quite that far with my undergraduates, but but I am going to look to if if I place a student and have them get credit for an internship, you know, I want some feedback about how was this person? What do you feel their strengths and weaknesses were? Uh, and I think some of that you get a very, very different perspective on what you're teaching by hearing how it translates into that sort of environment. Mm -hmm. That's great. Meg, I'll say one. I'll say one other thing, and I hadn't thought about it this way before, even in our earlier conversations. But I, I think maybe our most important allies in any given semester is actually just the current students. So we, you know, this could this not agree more. This yes. community that we build is real, and I use this analogy all the time, including like in writing with my students. But you can either see a really big course with a lot of big, you know, a lot of students. And I'll also say when we say TAs for the course, we have a lot of TAs. So we have like 250 students and 40 undergraduate TAs. Um, so our TA pool is like one of the larger courses in Georgetown in like its own way. Um, but uh, I try to make the course feel, so I love live music. Um, and I'll just confess, I'm a country music fan. And if you're not a country music fan, I'm sorry for you, but if you are, <laughs> the analogy must work for other types of music, but you know, I listen to it um, like in my earbuds and I listen to it in the car, but there's nothing like a live concert. And partially it's because you share that experience and the more people there are, the like more people you have to share it with. There's more of your people. Uh, Mary Dana Hinton said that, right? She's like, oh, I find myself among my people. So I'm at a concert. I find myself among my people. And one of the things we try to do is make a course feel like that community is your people. Um, and and you have a responsibility, not just to yourself, but you have a responsibility to others. Um, one of the things that we do on the very first day of class is we ask students to introduce themselves to each other, like turn around and shake the hands of everyone in the lecture hall nearby. Um, and then we ask them to make a commitment to one another um, that what they're committing to is not just striving their best for their own success in the course, but they're actually going to strive their best um, in really, really proactive ways on behalf of their peers who are sitting next to them. And they all kind of laugh and think I'm just strange and I don't really care. But on the last day of class, we have them turn back and we don't assign seats, but you all know everyone sits in the same bloody seat every day. So they're still sitting next to the people they sat to on the first day. Um, we have a pretty close to 100% survival rate in the course. Um, and so like most people are still there the last day and we give time for that conversation about what it meant to do that. And and that's now part of our culture um, and who we are. And that's just, um, and, and their sense of the possible and their sense that we're all in it together um, is probably our greatest ally because there's 250 of them. And then if I add them up, there's a thousand of them on my campus. That's a really powerful ally. Yes, and that building culture piece, um, you know, I think is really important both within the class and then 
some of the classes, in many instances, particularly those of us who are at larger public institutions, it's a whole constellation of people who are teaching. It might be multiple instructors. It may be different people from semester to semester. And so it's really that culture building piece is an ally or a barrier. Um, and so I would love to hear some more about building culture um, from you, from, from Alan or, or Jim, or from any of our participants. What's, what's been effective at building culture across instances of a course? Um, or where are some pitfalls that, that need to be massaged so that this, uh, the, the efforts are more successful? I don't know, Jim, you want to take a swing at that? I mean, with smaller courses, uh, with, with smaller courses, we used to run uh, lunches with uh, the instructional staff. But I mean, I, you know, seventy people or something in our Kelp One course that, that would be very challenging, I think, to, <laughs> to do that. But and and how much um, do you feel like there is a kind of existing? How strong is the existing culture? You know, where there's similarity across of expectations across. Uh, offerings, instructor sections, whatever the, the format is, are there similarities and how are those reinforced? Certainly in calculus, um, I, I do actually think that our calculus courses are, are broadly similar because they're so tightly coordinated and that, that tight coordination is incredibly important, I think, to be able to produce equitable outcomes. It's not fair to students if they have two courses that are not only the same, but they're actually completely different courses and graded mm -hmm. differently and everything. But the, the tight coordination, I think, really does help with that. And they really feel like the same um, courses. That's certainly not true of all of our multi-section courses. There are multi-section courses where there's a, quite a bit more variance in, in what happens. And I think we're working towards being able to reduce that variance because it is just such a huge equity issue. Right, right. I wanted to um, throw in another another sort of thought on the attendance issue, and that's, you know, when I uh, when I first got to Georgetown, I took a look at some of the some of the ratings on, you know, rate my professor. I asked the department to let me have a look at some of the course evaluations, and one of the really common the econ department at that time had a pretty bad reputation uh, as for teaching purposes, and one of the very common uh, comments that I would see on the course evals and the online postings was, oh, well, you know, by halfway through the semester, I stopped going to class. I would just, you know, look up the Khan Academy video or I, I would just use the textbook. OK, so and I and I, I, I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not competing with auxiliary resources. Right. Uh, it's a huge mistake to think, oh, I need to compete against a YouTube video or I need to compete against what somebody else is doing. No, those those are great learning resources. OK, Georgetown students are they're, they're crazy YouTubers. And so I, I tell them, look, hey, if you find something that you think is helpful, link it to me, man. I link my students, some of my own stuff, some other people's stuff. You know, the, the point is, if coming to class can be not just about content delivery, but can be about tying together all of these different sources, building an index for where to go to get help and, and making the whole experience more cohesive, that's what I think gets students to, to get out of bed and, and put their foot in the classroom door more so than, than what, what format is gonna deliver information most effectively. You know, really embrace the fact that a lot of your students are going to be getting information about the topics that you're covering from places other than your classroom and your mouth. And that's a good thing. Right, as Jim said, most of his students have already taken calculus. Um, and so it's not, it's not just about the content, but it is about that community. So that raises, a, we've got this menti question about rigor. Um, when it isn't as much about content, Rigor is nonetheless a major issue when we talk about, um, so on this mentee, people strongly agree that students fear the course that they're focused on because they perceive it as very difficult. They need a specific vocabulary and skill set, and college colleagues downstream have specific expectations. So even though the community is the important piece, the content, oh, I should screen share. I think everyone is seeing it on their own computers, but I will screen share also. 
Um, I think that community is really, really important, but the content is too. Um, and so are you seeing the Menti screen? I've got like three screens. Okay, thank you, Robin Dennison for nodding. You're like the student in the class where the nodding is a lifesaver. <laughs> thank you. So how, how do you deal with rigor? How does it show up in the conversation for your course? Any, and actually I'll throw this out to the audience. Please feel, you know, raise your hand and, and let us recognize you. I think this is a, this is clearly a hot button issue in these courses. So if someone would like to talk about what this means to them, I'd, I'd love to hear it. While people are working on their bravery for this, if, if uh, Jim or Alan or Heidi wants to chime in, that would be great. I'll, I'll I'll throw in my two cents here because that that tends to be um, a really maybe the central issue in the intermediate micro course that I teach, which is really all about making the transition from the very social sciencey terminology based uh, uh, descriptive learning in the principles classes to the upper level courses, which are all about quantitative models and. Uh, and I've really started to view this issue very differently lately. Um, rigor is, it the way that we describe it, I think sends some signals to students that, are, that aren't so great. Um, first of all, I think we make it about having a, having a checklist of courses that are named a certain thing or having seen a certain thing in class uh, before the class begins. Th that's that's your rigor. That's your prerequisites. And I and I think that's a it's a big mistake. You know, Jim uh, can tell you, right. A student that had calculus in high school does not have the same background as a student that has taken Calc 1 at a good university mm -hmm. math department. It's just it. They're not comparable experiences. And so when we when we tell students, it creates this perception, when we tell students you need X, Y, and Z to take the class, it creates this perception of, well, it, it's just all a checklist of things. The, the, the understanding, the depth doesn't matter. My ability to explain it doesn't matter. It's just all that. And that, that in turn creates this problematic expectation. I think in setting prerequisites and in, in setting um, expectations for a lot of these classes, we need to have a long, hard think about that has a lot to do with what the field is going to look like. And if, if we're sending signals to certain students that, that their backgrounds or their preparation is not valued, that's a, that's a big deal. I mean, I, I even, even forget prerequisites, but during the course I had a couple of, of, of students who happen to be young women, but uh, this could happen for any student, uh, tell me toward the end of the semester this past spring, you know, I, I, I really like the class. I feel like I got a lot out of it, but I've really, really struggled at certain points. And it's made me question whether I should major in, in economics. It's made me question whether that's right for me. And I, and I, I just, I mean, I did probably hurt. They probably heard me outside the building saying, no, you know, that that struggle is part of the experience. It's part of building that tool set. It's not your performance in this class at any one point in time is not a referendum on your future in the field. And I feel like sometimes we don't do enough to communicate that to our students that yeah. you're going to fail. And our job is to help you fail productively. Alan, I'll, I'll build on that one quickly. So, I mean, yeah, my, my course is unapologetically a hard course. I mean, our joke is that it's called like, they're called the hard sciences for a reason. <laughs> so, you know, um, but, but I think a couple of things, one, right, is that science exists as a discipline because we value failure and learning from failure. But, you know, there, there's a famous quote from a Nobel Prize winner in biology, a guy named Eric Bischaus, who got called uh, shortly after he'd won the Nobel Prize for some really profound work in developmental biology. And the reporter asked how his week had been. And he goes, 90% of the experiments failed pretty much like always. <laughs> and so, so, you know, so difficult work 
um, as Alan said, right? Failures are part of that, but then you also have to value a growth mindset. Then you have to build a growth mindset into your course because the fear of rigor is that failure is kind of the permanent mark. It's, it's the terminal mark, not just a phase that everybody goes through. Um, and so we, we try to balance real rigor um, with this growth mindset. And we do that in a bunch of different ways. I think the other thing is that um, by far and away, our hardest assignment in the class is um, a research paper. So this is a first semester bio course um, for many students is their first research paper in college. And we have students reading the primary scientific literature for this paper, and they don't know how to do this before the course. And most of them have never written a real research paper in a bio course. Um, and so there's a lot of newness. It's very hard. We scaffold it in all sorts of ways. Um, but it's a course in which we ask students to do some research into the genetic and environmental basis of a mental health topic. And we invite them to make that mental health topic something that's relevant to them in some personal, emotional, or intellectual way. Um, and then we invite them when they write the paper to bring themselves as people, whole people, and also as intellects into that paper. Um, this is an astonishingly, ridiculously audacious thing to assign. I don't know what I was thinking when I first came up with the idea. Um, it is ridiculously difficult. The work the students do on it is profoundly good work. And it is by far and away their favorite part of the course. And it is by far and away the most difficult part of the course. So I think that's taught us something really important about rigor and that rigor for rigor's sake is just off-putting to all of us, but rigor for the sake of you having a place to grow and where like all of you is welcomed into that growth space, um, the students are hungry for that. They can't get enough of that version of rigor. Um, and, and so we try to anchor it in experiences like that. That's really a great connection to that need for community and sense of mattering and belonging and bringing it into the academic space for them to see themselves there uh, and to see their interests. And their, I love the idea of them bringing themselves as an intellect that there's not just one right way, there's also your way of doing it and making space for that. Um, that's just really, really powerful. So I, I had written in my notes that Alan and Heidi have uh, academic jujitsu to take this idea of rigor and to, to call in and create belonging among your students. And I think you both did uh, a great job with that. And I just, before we go on and, and talk about assessment, I just want to really encourage um, encourage the people in the, in the rooms all across the country uh, to chime in and raise, you know, both strategies that have worked really well, things you've tried that have been frustrating or haven't worked the way expected or or questions uh, for this group. I understand on day three that uh, people's heads are full of what they're working on back home and, and I could listen to Alan, Heidi and Jim kind of endlessly. So I'm, I'm happy to have more questions for them, uh, but I would love to hear from you. Okay, well then we're gonna move on to talk about assessment. So we talked about this early on when we were you were saying what your allies were and the data. The data were your ally, um, which I, I love. Um, what kinds of data are you collecting? How are you assessing the impact of changes you're making? And, and are these data that are collected external to your course? Are they data you're, you've requested? Um, anything you wish you could get that you haven't figured out how to get? There's a bunch of smart people. Um, in the chat that we could get uh, we could get some feedback from. Jim, I know you know a lot about assessment uh, and how we assess at Ohio State. and so I'm gonna I'm gonna make you talk because I you could there's a lot to say about what we're doing with assessment. Yeah, yeah, there really there really is. Um, so I guess, I mean, there's a couple of ways to think about assessment. So I mean, maybe one, one side is how we're assessing student learning in, in the classroom. And then the other side is how we're assessing the effectiveness of the um, changes that we've been making to these large courses. Uh, certainly around assessing student learning, uh, you know, I think about how assessment is some combination of achievement and activity that we're measuring in the courses. Uh, I think historically, a lot of our 
assessment of student learning has really just been around achievement and not necessarily um, measuring you know, just activity that that people are doing. Um, but we do actually want to record, you know, somehow reward um, our students for doing the activities that will I think, eventually help them to have more achievement um, rather than just uh, rewarding sort of the end result of, of the course. We want to be encouraging, you know, behaviors that are that are helpful along the way. Um, and that certainly, you know, uh, I think influenced how we've been thinking about changing how we assess student learning in these courses so that we do have some component of that, which is more focused on um, you know, rewarding students for uh, you know, the kinds of group work, cooperation, um, consistent practice with online automated homework, things, things like that. Uh, in terms of how we're assessing the overall changes, um, I mean, the, the biggest thing, you know, is, of course, grades. You know, we want to make sure that students are, in fact, passing the courses. Um, but we've also been doing um, some effective surveys just to understand a little bit more about how our students are are feeling um, about a course like calculus, um, which certainly brings up a lot of feelings in, uh, in, in the course. Um, and we've done, you know, I think some things that are that are interesting along those lines too. Um, you know, like, like asking students every week for some kind of effective uh, feedback in the course, and and you can see that as the uh, semester goes on, you know, people get more and more stressed out during the course, and I was I was really shocked um, to just to see that. Uh, and then of course we have to think about ways that can help um, you know folks manage some of the feelings that that calculus brings up so are all of those mid are all of those assessment efforts uh local so they're all happening with the instructors or in the math department are there bigger picture things you're tapping into yeah um, so other kinds of assessment initiatives yeah a, a lot of that is stuff that's happening um within the department um the the hhmi driving change uh project that ohio state uh, is part of you know is also um uh, been a part of the assessment uh, strategy, and certainly, um, you know, they're gathering data, and we're gathering data, sort of in support of that those efforts um, specifically. Heidi or Alan, what have you? Are there assessment strategies that you're using in addition to what the kinds of things Jim's talking about? Frankly, I'd love to hear any ideas from other folks on the call because this is I put this in chat, but I lament all the time. You know, grades in most courses are much more about level than gradient. Uh, you know, it, it, and again, some of this is unavoidable, right? But the vast majority of the students who earn A's are coming into the class with better preparation, with stronger marks in the previous courses. And again, I, I, I don't know that, that we can ever or should ever try to eliminate that. But, you know, I'm a big, I'm an economist, right? I mean, I'm a big believer that people respond to incentives. And so trying to, and I, I love Jim's point or idea about let's, let's make grading more about the assessment of specific objectives being achieved during the course rather than just a flat exam because it incentivizes activity and incentivizes work during the semester rather than just, hey, I'm gonna study for this test. And I think, you know, you mentioning that students coming in with this different degrees of um, preparedness, it's really about us not harming them versus adding value to their approach. If they're an A student and they already understand it, you wouldn't be able to, you, all you're doing is not messing them up, right? Not, well, so there's uh, it, no way to really see what's the value that my course has yeah. added to them in skills and their preparedness for the next thing. You're coasting. You couldn't. I wouldn't coasting. go quite you that far, but I'd I'd say it's it's just in a class that you know we're going to introduce partial derivatives in the first three weeks. People that already have a really good working knowledge of calculus, it's just it's one less ball that they have to keep in the air, right? That's the that's the big advantage. Right. right. And so there's no. And it's not that you want to, not that you want to downweight or penalize the students who already have that under control, but you want to yeah. focus on how you help students get that other ball up in the air and, and into play. Um, Meg, Meg, I dropped something into the chat, which I won't reiterate because I won't trust the audience to be able to read it. But I'll say one thing that we did, which, and I'll give the origin of it really in a really, really quick story here. Um, so in lots of the world, parts of the world where I've grown up, um, when we look at the sky and we look at constellations, we connect all the the stars, right? And that's, and then you like have a really vivid imagination or like serious drug use and you like see things in the star patterns. 
but in parts of the world where, and at points in time, when um, you really can really see stars in the sky, you realize that like most of the sky is lit up and it's actually the dark spaces that are relatively rare. And so um, uh, my daughter and I, when she was little, visited um, the outback in Australia, uh, where the cultures there, the Aboriginal cultures there among the indigenous peoples is to actually, they have constellations, but it's the dark spaces. And it occurred to me that what was powerful was that it was only there where you knew where you could see a lot of stars that you could kind of delineate the dark spaces. So I, I tell the story to my students and we actually give them credit on exams for both correct answers or actually they get never get any credit for answers. They get credit for really good explanations, but you can also earn a majority of credit by carefully explaining what you know and what it is you think you're missing to be able to fully answer the question. So we basically ask them to say like, you know a lot, you know about all those many, many, many stars in the sky. Um, and you know what you don't know is that dark space. And if you can delineate that, that version of the constellation, if you can delineate that clearly for us, you can earn basically full credit um, because what we're really valuing is this tool set, as Alan said before, to kind of help you think your way using your knowledge to tackle non-trivial problems. And, and and you can get really close to it and still not be able to solve that problem. Um, and so in a sense, I guess this is, um, Jim, if I was to say in math terms, it's like showing your work, right? Like you get close enough. Um, that has turned out to be, I, I have to say, it, I think it's more psychological because students like often head that way on an exam. You can tell they freaked out and they're like, okay, I'm gonna tell you what I know. And they, find their way to an answer by like getting more stuff on the page, right. but we do seriously practice it. And I, I think it's an important message that, you know, um, that you can also slow down and think and build with your knowledge and your partial knowledge isn't just worth partial credit in that sense. It's worth credit because you're building this much richer, many starred in the sky kind of level of understanding. And that's so much more meaningful. Sometimes students will just kind of vomit out everything they know that is mildly relevant and ask you to sort through it, which doesn't show that pro that that understanding that comes from curating, selecting, highlighting, connecting what you do know. Um, and it's less so it's both a more sophisticated way to show, you know, by by doing that. And it's a lot less annoying as the person grading it. If I have to go through, I already I already understand it. If I have to go through and find the connections, then I'm doing the work again. And so that's, um, I can see how that would be really beneficial pedagogically and also a nice alternative to just students panicking and dropping everything they know on the page and not thinking through it. Um, and, and so I really like that. So let's focus specifically on equity. Um, and uh, you know what what equity issues you've seen alleviated or addressed in the interventions that you've made. So we've talked a little bit about this, the sense of belonging, um, you know, this uh, focusing on the importance of practice and engagement, not just getting the correct answer, but learning how to fail productively and, and engaging and focusing on concrete things like standards and, and concepts rather than specific facts. What what equity issues do you think have been alleviated? Which ones do you have intu intuition about and which ones do you have data on? Nobody wants to jump at that one. That's a tricky one. I was say, wait, is, that for, is that for us or for others? Um, well, so I'll say a couple things. So we um, So we can track students by um, certain demographics. Um, so we we know things about, um, high schools, for example, that our students come from. Uh, we know things about um, AP or IB coursework that they've taken, credit that they've earned or not earned for that. We do a bunch of pre-assessments and things like that as well. Um, we understand students who are first-gen students and things like that. And so, I mean, we don't, as, fa as faculty, we don't get all that data at the outset, but we can like look back at the end of the course and request those data. Um, so also, yeah, to be clear to folks, like I don't know that to start with, but we can go back and look at it. Um, so that's one of our primary goals. When I took over the course, I, I started on a lot of this work um, because the first time I taught it, I thought I had done a horrible job when I asked for the data and the data convinced me I had done a horrible job. And then it turns out 
relatively speaking, I hadn't, that was like super depressing. Um, so I think we do a couple of things. Um, one is that we, uh, because students can't buy out with AP or IB credit, we also then need to make the course just something fundamentally different than AP or IB courses. And it is dramatically different in the narrative that we shape, in the work that we ask them to do. Um, it is still an advantage to have had really high quality high school science experiences. I, I, we're not sure we can make that not an advantage because it's college, it's building on high school. Um, but by making it as new a game as we can, um, we find that that levels the playing field. But we also know in the conversations we've heard about teaching from the heart and mattering and belonging that an awful lot of this is feeling like when you're doing hard work and when you're struggling, that what you're doing is worthy and important and that there's space for you in doing that. So I think again, our undergraduate TAs, um, we work really hard as a faculty to be diverse and inclusive. And like many institutions like ours, we pretty much fail at that. We don't have a very diverse or inclusive faculty at Georgetown, um, but our undergraduate TAs are in every possible conceivable way, a very diverse group. And that's like literally you name an identity and academic and personal and co-curricular. And like, it's, they're just an astonishingly diverse group because they're so large. Um, we encourage them to bring them whole selves forward um, and we celebrate that. Um, and they are just an incredible driving force for um, being visible leaders in what it means to build an environment in which uh, we genuinely expect everybody to succeed. Um, and and that that's a goal for all of us in the course for that success. And so, you know, for us, part of it is that we can't change what folks come in with in terms of prior science knowledge, but we can value all sorts of just their presence, but we can also value whether skills and talents. If you've made your way to Georgetown from a situation in which your high school didn't prepare you as well academically, then you're an incredibly smart, accomplished, talented, determined person. And we do our best to build a course that lets those qualities shine, mm -hmm. gives credit for those qualities, because um, that'll make them a hell of a scientist too. We're pretty convinced of that. Absolutely. I'm going to let Alan and Jim talk, and I'm going to move the mentee forward so that people can talk, uh, can chime in on uh, how these kinds of changes would make a difference on their campus while Alan is talking. I just wanted to, to echo what Heidi said and emphasize the importance that the, the messaging around this stuff really matters, because I find when a lot of students come into my courses, the perception is, well, there are these other people in the class that are more prepared, that have seen all the calculus, that have had more of the math, and, and they're just at this insurmountable, insurmountable advantage. They're always going to be ahead, and you know they're the ones that are going to get the good jobs and go on to the investment banks, yada, yada, yada. And I think that, that growth mindset is just such a, a critical part of, of how you undo a lot of that perception that you emphasize to people that this this is, you know, I say this on the first day of class that what we do in this class is a lot like running. You know, we can we can read every copy of Runner's World that's ever been printed. We can talk all day about how to train what to eat uh, the night before a race. And all of that is going to improve your mile time by exactly this much. OK, the way to get faster is you go out there and run. And similarly, you know, it, Almost no professional economist that I know knew all of the quantitative skills that they needed uh, in their dissertation when they started graduate school. Almost no professional economist I know knew all of the skills that they were going to need on their first few, few handful of professional uh, projects when they started that job or graduated from school. This is a it's a it's a field as I, I sense that more and more scientific disciplines are becoming that that rewards continuing to add to that toolkit. And so your, your success or failure in the class isn't determined 
by by how many terms or symbols you know coming in. It's a function of your ability to integrate these tools into your thinking and to, uh, to understand the process of solving these problems. And I think that the more the more you make it clear that we're going to reward the journey, okay, uh, rather than rewarding the people that that come in with all the bells and whistles, uh, the better off you are. I think a, a lot of the the concerns, again, there, there is a with equity, there's a big concern that I have, especially in economics, that we're sending signals with these with these intro and intermediate level classes about what kinds of backgrounds, what kinds of skills are valued in this discipline. And it has been increasingly clear in the last few years, we're sending the signal to a lot of students that you're not valued in our field. And and I am, believe me, I wish I had all the answers to this. I am I am at the beginning of my own journey in figuring out how to push back on this. But it is something that I think that I think everybody ought to be looking at right now because the students are he are very sensitive in today's environment to those kinds of messages, whether they're intended or not. And, and they're going to be making decisions about their futures based on them as much as what you actually do inside the classroom. That, um, Jim, please, we're just about, we're just about a time. We have time to, if you're into this conversation, you want to stay with us, you can. We're doing office hours. As I said, I could, we could just talk about this all the time. Um, so we, there's more time to talk, but I'd love, I'd love to have you, uh, kind of talk about the equity angle for calculus. Yeah, I just I noticed the mention of contact uh, grading in the um, Minty here, and you know, I really have been excited. Um, you know, the the pilots uh, in the math department for standards based grading. I think it's a lot more principled. You know, and one way to measure success there is just the folks in the standards based sections did a little bit better in calculus two on you know, which is a more traditionally graded um, class with the kind of traditional midterms at all. Um, but but the folks in the standards based uh, pilot sections also, uh, you know, did better on effective measures as well in terms of uh, doing uh, being, being higher in the sense of belonging, self efficacy and engagement uh, with um, compared to the sort of traditional uh, Calc 1 students. So I, I, I just I think that's, you know, contract grading, standards based grading, you know, some kind of grading um, that I think is more principled, you know, is a, is a big opportunity for improving outcomes in these courses. Thank you. And thank you all for being here and for, for thinking about how you can use curriculum to support your students and to support student success. We'll be here for office hours. I think it's a different Zoom room, so we need to log out and log in. We hope to see some of you there and, and, and welcome hearing from you in that. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Heidi, Alan, and Jim. Um, and uh, we'll see you, we'll see you in a little bit. And thanks again. <laughs>